Hello, my name is Anton Angeletti, and I'm currently a rising senior in Lincoln Southwest High School. This summer, I studied X-ray diffraction under the mentorship of Hao Han Wang in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at UNL. So first I'll provide some background on X-rays. So X-rays are a form of electromagnetic radiation at wavelengths roughly in the order of 10 to the negative 10th meters, and they're most commonly measured in angstroms. Uh, so X-ray diffraction originates in 1912 when this man, Max von Lau, and two of his colleagues had decided to perform an experiment using X-rays on crystals. And they chose X-rays for this purpose because they have a wavelength similar to the interatomic distances within crystal structures. We found that if these interatomic distances within a crystal are known, then the wavelength can be measured and vice versa. And essentially, we can define X-ray diffraction as a non-destructive technique for studying the molecular and crystallographic structure of a material. So now I'll talk a little about crystals. So crystals can be defined as solids composed of atoms, ions, or molecules arranged in a periodic three-dimensional pattern. This means that crystals can be mathematically represented by lattices. You can see examples of lattices here in all three dimensions. And a lattice is just an infinite array of points in which each point is an identical environment to all the others. A particular lattice is defined by its unit cell, shown here with this black box, which repeats infinitely in every dimension and contains information about the patterns and symmetry of the crystal structure, as well as the types and locations of its atoms. And that can be shown with this example here of sodium chloride, where you can see the atoms and the structure within the unit cell that will be replicated throughout the crystal structure. So briefly, here are the 14 possible point lattices. Uh, and these were demonstrated by crystallographer Bravais in 1848 and are called the Bravais lattices. So in order to represent crystal structures, we need to first look at how to represent points within a lattice. So any point within a lattice can be represented by a position vector r. Uh, which can be found with either of these equations. And the vectors a, b, and c uh, represent movement in the direction of each respective uh, axis, a, b, and c. Uh, and then u, v, and w, the coefficients, are all integer coordinates of a particular cell within the lattice uh, with respect to the unit cell. And then n, p, and q are non-integer coordinates of a particular point within that cell. So this allows you to represent any point within a lattice. So in order to represent planes in a lattice, we can use a system called Miller indices, which are H, K, and L corresponding to the axes A, B, and C, respectively. Uh, and these represent fractional intercepts with each axis. So H now represent the fractional intercept A divided by H with, uh, that the plane makes with the axis A, and the same with B divided by K, uh, intercepting the axis B, and then the same with C divided by L. And you can see an application of this with this plane 4, 2, 1, uh, this four corresponding to the fractional intercept uh, with axis A, uh, meaning that it intercepts with one fourth of the unit cell uh, in axis A, and the same for uh, one half of B and then one with C. Uh, and then this also illustrates a key aspect of lattice planes, which is that uh, a line and its corresponding plane are perpendicular. So this one, one, one line right here, as an example, uh, goes through the point one, one, one within the unit cell. Uh, and then its plane 111 is perpendicular to that, which you can see in this example uh, structure LSMO. Bragg's law helps us to define the relation between X-ray wavelengths and interatomic distance in crystal structures. So it's defined as n lambda equal to 2d prime sine theta, and it can be alternatively written as lambda equal to 2d sine theta, where d is equal to d prime divided by n. And then here n is any integer, and then lambda is the wavelength of the diffracted X-ray beam uh, shown here. Uh, and then D is the spacing here between the diffracting crystal planes, and then theta is the diffracting angle right here. And then as a side note, two theta is more commonly used experimentally than just theta, so that's what we'll be using later on. So how are X-rays created physically? Uh, generally, X-rays are produced when a charged particle, such as an electron, rapidly decelerates, and this can be done in X-ray tubes, which uh, an example of which can be shown here, and then a diagram is shown here where a high voltage makes electrons strike a target at a high speed, and most of the energy is lost as heat, but some X-rays are produced at the point of impact. So in order to measure X-ray diffraction, we can use what's called a diffractometer. So here we have the parts of a diffractometer labeled. So first are the X-ray tubes, which is where the X-ray beams are initially produced, and then those beams meet the sample holder, which is where you would place the powder sample that you would want to study. And then we have the detector, which detects and measures the diffracted beams. Uh, and then we have a diagram of what's happening here, where we have the X-rays coming from the X-ray source, meeting the atoms within the sample, and then uh, being collected by the detector. And then this also illustrates uh, a key capability of the tractometer, which is that the source and the detector are both capable of rotating around uh, the sample, which allows any angle theta to be studied. 
So here we have our data for the crystal structure CFO, which can be shown here uh, at the cubic structure. And then on the graph, we have intensity of the diffracted X-ray beam on the Y-axis, and then the two theta value on the X-axis. Then here we can see several noticeable peaks of uh, intensity at specific two theta values, and these values represent certain planes, which I have written in here. So looking more closely at the first peak uh, that's on the graph here, we have the plane 111, which is at the two theta value of 22.14 degrees. Uh, so here we can use Bragg's law here, uh, and notice that we have uh, two theta here as 22.14 degrees, which allows us to find theta, which is 11.07 degrees. And we also have lambda, which is just the wavelength of the x-rays that were, uh, we used, which uh, was 1.789 angstroms. And we can plug these both into uh, Bragg's law and find that the d spacing between the planes is equal to 4.659 angstroms. And then this can be visualized here, where the d spacing is between each of these planes. And then this is the crystal structure of CFO. So again, uh, we can look at the data, but for the highest peak this time. So this highest peak is for the plane 222 at the two theta value of 42.34 degrees. Uh, and then again, we can find theta from two theta to be equal to 21.17 degrees. And then we have the same lambda value before, as before. So again, we can plug that into Bragg's law and then find that E is equal to 2.477 angstroms. Uh, and then this is, can again be visualized with this diagram here where the D spacing is the spacing between each of the planes. So as a conclusion, X-ray diffraction can be used to identify and categorize unknown crystalline materials, as well as study the structure and symmetries of known crystalline materials. And the basic idea of X-ray diffraction is synthesized with Bragg's law, which defines the relationship between uh, X-ray wavelengths and interatomic distances within crystals, and allows us to uh, represent the despacing between specific planes within the crystals. And then the information from the X-ray diffraction comes from the diffraction angle, which can then be transferred to the despacing in the crystal structure.